of Ephesians since before Christmas, so we're probably somewhat uh, familiar with it, at least to this point. But as you turn there, I just want to take a couple of moments again to share a little bit about Paul's background in Ephesus. Paul had personal experience in the city of Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, we read of a lot of things that were going on in Ephesus while Paul was there. God was doing some amazing works and the people were taking notice. It tells us in that chapter of Acts that people were even bringing napkins and uh, aprons and things like that uh, for Paul and those with him to touch, believing uh, that those objects that were touched by Paul could be transported and touch those with skin diseases and they could be healed. But while Paul was doing the works of God, we read also that there were a lot of ungodly things happening in the city of Ephesus. Uh, the devil was most certainly at work. Seven sons of Sceva were mentioned there as trying to perform miraculous works. And it was very evident to the crowd that compared to the works of God, uh, they were failing. And so people were taking notice of what God was doing. And the scripture says that many people were repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and confessing him. But it did not stop there. As we read further in the book of Acts chapter 19, uh, Paul's problems were not just with those seven sons of Sceva, but there was a great work of God that happened. A famous silversmith there uh, had converted to the faith. And as a result of converting to his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this newfound faith, this silversmith gave up his work of creating idols in uh, the image of Artemis. And so he was involved in the idolatry, but the problem was he was also involved in big business and those who were benefiting from his work became upset and so they came after Paul. Paul had offended not only the temple of Artemis, but he had offended the pocketbooks of the individuals. And so we see that Paul, by the hand of God, escaped from that city. But he did not miss out on the truth that there was a battle when he was there between light and darkness. Now, Paul spent about two and a half years in Ephesus. Other than the sending city Antioch, Paul spent more time in Ephesus than in any place during his journeys. And so now in Ephesians, he's writing some four to five years later from personal experience, and he's challenging and encouraging the church to live distinctly in that particular city, to be light in the midst of darkness. You might think facing the circumstances that Paul had faced, who was strong in the Lord, and understanding the circumstances that the church at Ephesus was facing, that Paul would have a defeatist attitude, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, as he's writing the church here, and as we've looked in these last couple of chapters, Paul is telling the Ephesian church that they were positioned to make a positive impact. And so he's challenging them as their position to make this positive impact. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5. I want to begin in verse 8. Ephesians 5. In the second part of, well, let me go ahead and read all of verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible, for what makes everything visible is light. Therefore, it says, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Don't be Foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, 
singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word today, help us to understand how these words that were written around 2,000 years ago, Lord, apply to our lives today. And Father, may it be today that we would engage in this study and as we leave this place, that we would resolve to go from this place being a light in our circles. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Today we're continuing this study that we've been looking at for the last two or three weeks about the conduct of the followers of Christ in speech, in word, in attitude, in thought. Believers are called to imitate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this means that we'll be distinct from the world. We're going to look today at a truth that as Christians, we're to be in the world but not of the world. God has never called us as believers to withdraw from the world. We can't have an impact that way. Yet as we are involved in the world, whether it be in the workplace, at school, wherever we might find ourselves, we're to be distinct from the world. We must live in the world, but not take on its attributes. And so we've been looking at that truth for the last two to three weeks. But again, this morning, as with last week, we're going to focus on two primary commands. You say, Rick, you always have three-point messages. Well, these two weeks, we're taking a break uh, from it. We're going to revisit our second command from last week, which says, walk as children of light. You might say, well, Rick, why are we going back and looking at what we looked at last week? Because we're going to see today that there's a lot more to that command. In fact, the first six verses that I read today are related to walking as children of the light. And so simply put, we're just not finished. Last week was not enough time uh, to look at that. But this week added to that command, we're going to see a second one, and we see it in verse 15 where Paul writes to the church and says, pay careful attention to how you live. And so we're going to look at these. Well, first this morning, look with me at what Paul writes in verse 8. In the the last part of that verse, he says, live as children of the light. Now, now my translation says live. Yours may say walk. Literally, it's the Greek word peripateo, which means to walk about and around. And the idea of walking about and around speaks to the Christian's lifestyle. Wherever you are, whether it be in church, at home, in the workplace, at the grocery store, you're called to live consistently with the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we saw that Jesus said to his followers, you are the light of the world. He told them that in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. And along with that, you may remember in that portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he also said, you are the salt of the earth. And without going into too much depth, the truth of the matter is this, Both light and salt are effective as they're distinct from that which is around them. Uh, Today we use salt, for instance, to flavor our food. But if you've ever been in a third world country where there's little refrigeration, you understand where I'm going with this. If you've been on a mission trip or in this particular culture, salt is a preservative. But salt, to be a preservative, must maintain its saltiness. In fact, uh, Jesus said in that very same Sermon on the Mount, if the salt has lost its saltiness, what good is it for anything except to be cast down and tread on by our feet? We might say in the same way with light. If, If a light bulb goes out, it's just taking up space. It's not providing light. And so as the light of the world, as the salt of the earth, We must remain distinct from our world, and we must be connected to our world. And so as we looked last week at uh, God's uh, challenge and God's command to the people of Israel in the Old Testament, that they were a chosen people, that they were a royal priesthood, that they were distinct from the nations around them. So we as Christians are called to be holy. We're called to be distinct. In fact, our effectiveness is contingent on our distinction. You know, we can't be like the world and impact the world. 
You know, there are a lot of reasons for the problems in our country and the world today, but at least in part, one of the main problems is we as the church are not living as the light. We're, we're becoming too much like the world, not distinct from the world. You and your circles are to be a person of integrity. No one should be able to point the finger at you and say, he's a sorry person. That person is not real. No one should be able to point and say, what she, profess, what she will profess, she does not possess. We must be a witness for the Lord. We can't be like the world and impact the world. And so as we look at it, we see that we're to be people of distinction. You know, Martin Luther, the great reformer, uh, had a very brief eulogy at a fellow pastor's funeral. The pastor's name was Nicholas Hausman. And in this brief eulogy, Martin Luther said this of Reverend Hausman, what we preach, he lived. Isn't that what we're all to do? That which we preach, we must live. That's what the world needs to see. Well, we can be into all types of apologetics trying to argue in favor of the faith, but many times we'll just have arguments come back to us. The greatest way we can impact the world is by demonstrating the Lord that we serve, possessing His holiness, His love, His character, shining in and through us. Notice what it says in verse 10, that we are to test what is pleasing to the Lord. We're to prove to those around us, this is the life that is the real life that is accepted before the Lord. You know, I think back to the illustration last week as we were looking at light. And you remember uh, just about three chapters before uh, what is described of Paul's experience in Ephesus, he was in Corinth. And you may remember that he was in, in, in prison. And, and then the earthquake came and, and it shook and, and the, 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 the jail doors began to open, the building opened. And as Paul was leaving, he turned and saw that the jailer, distraught over the fact that he would lose the prisoners, was ready to take his own life. And Paul said, no, wait, we're all here. And he went and he, along with his companions, went back into that prison cell. That was being light to that man who was in darkness, so dark that he was ready to take his own life, but he looked at the light of the Lord through Paul, and it made a difference. Let me ask you today, are you living that way in your circles? It's not something that we can manufacture. In fact, if we try to manufacture it, it'll just be a false representation. It is yielding and allowing the Lord to work in and through our lives. And we need to be connected with unbelievers. We're, we're not to participate in their deeds, but we're also not to insulate ourselves from them. The separation from the world speaks not to a lifestyle. It speaks to lifestyle, rather, but not present. In other words, it doesn't mean that we're to be absent from people but we're just not to participate in their things. You know, many times we as Christians, we say, I'm just going to insulate myself from the world. I'm just going to live in my own little circle. I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not going to be affected by people who don't believe in Christ. The problem is that isn't how Jesus lived. You see, he, he did not embrace the lifestyle, but that did not mean that he took his presence away. He was there. Notice what Paul writes in verse 11. Don't participate in the deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. Now think practically. Think about light. Light is only going to be effective when it's nearby. A, a light in Alaska is not going to help me. And so people will say, well, I'm just not going to associate with any unbelievers. I'm just going to uh, insulate myself with fellow believers, and I'm going to live in this dream world, and it's going to be perfect. But the problem is, God's Word tells us in verse 11, we can't live that way. We're not to participate in their acts, but we are to expose them. Now, how are we going to expose them if we're not around them? You see, that's just like a light that's all the way across the country. It's not going to make any type of impact. 
And so we're called to reach out to those who don't know Christ. Before we move to the next command, though, I want to look at what verse 14 says. It's interesting. It says, for what makes everything visible is light. That's what reveals wrongdoing from right living. Therefore, it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. If you're notice, noticing it in your Bible, it looks as a quote, but it's not an Old Testament quote, nor is it found anywhere as a direct quote anywhere else. It says there, therefore, it is said, I think it may have been either a common saying in that day, or it may have been a song that was sung with, with which they could be familiar, and it's saying, get up, sleeper, rise up. Christ will shine on you. As I apply that to you and to me today, what it's saying is wake up church, be revived, realize these days that we're living in are dark days. And if we don't shine the light, if we don't wake up, people will not see the light. We need a resolved spirit to reach people for Christ, a renewed spiritual vigor. It's not something that we can manufacture. We need to reassert our resolve to be an agent of impact for the Lord Jesus Christ in our circles. Are you that? Are you that in the workplace? When people see you, do they notice there's something different about that person? Are you different at school? When people observe you, there's an attractiveness. I'm not speaking outwardly. I'm speaking to an attractiveness that comes through uh, Christ living in and through you. We're called to be light. We're called to be light in our circles. But notice the second command. Paul writes in verse 15, pay careful attention to how you live. I've shared with the church before, I always tell my kids this, it's almost a joke. Keep your head on a swivel. If they're walking out in a parking lot at night, your head on a swivel. If you're driving and you're coming to an intersection, your head on a swivel. Keep alert, be aware of your surroundings. Here Paul is saying, pay attention don't just walk around with no focus. Be alert with your head on a swivel, looking at the challenges and the opportunities before you. And so we see that specific general command that we're to pay attention to how we live. But then we see four addendums to that. There are four ways that we might say we can live that out, and they're found right here in our text. He says, pay careful attention to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. You know, we have a lot of knowledgeable people today. A lot of people can spew out knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. They don't know how to apply that knowledge. And we're not talking about technical knowledge here. We're talking about wisdom through the experience of walking with the Lord. And so Paul gives these four things related to the command beginning in verse 16. And the first is this, if we are going to pay careful attention to how we live, first, we're going to make the most of the time. It literally means buying back or redeeming the time. It means valuing the time in which we live, not wasting it. When the church uh, blessed Karen and me with our trip uh, back uh, last August, what a, what a wonderful time, or it was actually September, all my months are running together. But it was a wonderful time. And, and while we were there, we were in Rome. Now we flew overnight, we arrived at Rome on Sunday, we awaited for the rest of our party to come. Uh, we spent Sunday night adjusting. Then Monday morning, we had uh, scheduled tours. We were able to see the Vatican, and, and that was just an amazing experience, St. Peter's Basilica in the Colosseum. It was about 2 o'clock on Monday afternoon. We were free from our scheduled tour. We would leave the next morning, maybe never to return to Rome again, and there was that temptation for me to go back and sleep for a couple of hours until dinner. But I finally woke up in, in my mind, and I told Karen, I said, we've got to get an Uber, and we need to go see everything we can see because we're not going to have another opportunity and so we were able to see the Trevi Fountain, the Spanish Steps. We were able to go into areas that were well populated. And it was because we did what? We made the most of the time. We could have gone back and we would have missed out. 
Believer, don't miss out on the opportunities God has given you. I, I text a handful of pastors, Brian Goff being one of them, Chris Cook, and sometime on Sunday mornings, I'll, I'll say I'm praying for you. I'll challenge them. They'll, they'll send me. And this morning, I, I sent out a group text. There's about five. Bruce, I sent Bruce uh, a group text about five. Jeff Slaughter. And uh, I, I shared this personally. Um, in the last month, I've seen three ministers, two of them my age, who are not able to preach any longer because of health uh, challenges. And so I told these guys, I said, man, we have an opportunity today, and we don't know when we'll have that opportunity again. It, it, it grieved my heart. One of them I, I saw in Farmville not long ago, a guy I really respect, he said, I'm just not able to preach anymore. His mind is not clear. Make the most of every opportunity. Don't live the day wastefully. If we're going to uh, live wisely, we need to make most of the time, make the most of it. Secondly, as we look at, at uh, the response to the paying careful attention to how we live, in verse 17, he says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In other words, he's contrasting foolish living with living in an understanding of the will of God. And so it's not just saying, don't go out there and make a fool. What it is saying is live your life knowing the will of God. Now, I'll be honest, there are a lot of things we don't understand about the will of God. Uh, for instance, you may one day have two great job opportunities and you think it's really hard to discern the will. It may not, oh God in this, it may not be like that. But you know, for every one of those instances, there are so many instances where we clearly know the will of God, that we're to be faithful in our marriage, that we're not to be controlled by anger, that we're not to be greedy people. And so when we begin to know the will of God, then we're living wisely. We're making the most of the time. We're paying careful attention. I love the Sunday school lesson today because it talked about the character of God. And the character of God, we know through the Word of God. I shared with our class, when the devil tempted Eve, the first two things he tried to attack, the Word of God and the character of God. The Word of God, did God really say? The character of God, God knows that when you uh, eat of this tree, you'll be like He is. In other words, His character He's holding out on you. And those two things we look at separately, but they're intertwined because we cannot separate the character of God from the Word of God. And you know the problem? We're not reading the Word of God enough in our lives. It's not enough to just be fed on Sunday morning. We need to have a regular, regular reading of the Bible. Lifeway Research says that only one-third of professing believers read their Bibles daily. That's an indictment on the church. We should be people who read the Bible daily, not just for head knowledge, but God, I want to read this word. I want you to speak to me through it, and I want it to transform my life. Do you want wisdom? Read God's word. Apply what God teaches you through his word. And so if we're going to pay, pay careful attention to how we live, we're going to live our words, our lives wisely on the Word of God, knowing the will of God. But then, thirdly, living Spirit-controlled lives. That's what we see in verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. You know, I love all of the mission trips that I've been a part of, and one of the great joys of going on mission is partnering with fellow believers. And I'll be honest, I love partnering with fellow believers in other churches, but the most treasured to me are hanging with Concord people. Randy and I got pretty close when we were sitting in a room that was about as big as those, half of those two pews. We were on a mission trip one time, and I don't think I got on his nerves. He didn't get on my nerves. But you know, one thing that I've loved our trips to Vermont, and one reason I love them, there's no language barrier, although we do talk with a southern twang. At least we speak English, and they do. And we were told by Dr. Ballard and 
and Doris has been on those trips, but they love having us up there. And one thing he said is that the people of Vermont in Bennington, Vermont are intrigued with these Christians who are coming up there. He says, they, they see us in the restaurants, they see, and they said, it, it's an enigma to them. They, it's a curiosity. He said, these people are happy. These people are respectful. There's a joy. I don't know about you, but you get a bunch of Christians together and there's nothing that the world, any fraternity party, anything else can compare than the real joy that comes through the Spirit. And every time I read verse 19, I think of that. I think of that corporate speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual, singing songs and making music with your heart to the Lord. The joy that comes in music and in speaking and in being in that fellowship. We're to live that way. Paul is saying here, be led and empowered by the Spirit of God. Don't be drunk on wine. Now, I do not want to go beyond what the Scripture says here. That would be handling the Word of God wrongly. We're going to look at that. But I will say this as a way of personal testimony. I do not drink alcoholic beverages at all, and I've not for over 37 years, if you keep in count, that's six years longer than I've been pastor here. And I don't condemn someone who takes a drink and stops. I'm not doing that. But there are two reasons I personally do not drink alcohol. Well, there's a third one that's, the last, I just don't like the taste of it. <laughs> Coca-Cola tastes a lot better to me. I've had it in the past. It's been a while, but I've, I've had enough to, to know. For most people, it's an acquired taste. But there are two reasons I totally abstain. One is my mom. My mom was a firm mom, and she said, not with me, she said, but Rick, in the Wooldridge family, alcohol has been a problem, and you better watch it because it will take you in and draw you in. And so my, my mother instructed me, and it was, it was not easy for her to do. The second reason I don't do it is I don't want to be a stumbling block to someone else. Someone struggling with alcoholism, and they come in McAdoo's, and I'm sitting taking a beer down, what is the first thing the devil will do? Hey, the preacher at Concord's doing it. It must be fine. Now, again, I judge no one. I have to share my conviction. And I only go as far as what the Scripture directly teaches, and it says this, don't get drunk on wine. Drunkenness is unbecoming to the believer. It can lead to foolish things that we say and we do. The believer should rather be led by the Spirit. Guess what? I've seen a lot of people in my life. My grandfather, by the grace of God, escaped the throes of, of alcoholism and became a great witness to me as a grandchild. But I've never seen anyone who has regretted being filled with the Spirit. I've seen a lot of people regret by being filled with alcohol, but never once someone regretting being filled by the Spirit. So we're to live spirit controlled lives. And then fourthly, if we're going to pay careful attention to how we live, we'll possess a right attitude toward God and man. First God. Look at verse 20. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks in everything. Karen was sharing with me, and if you've ever been in a pastor's house Sunday morning, you have no idea the chaos, you know, <laughs> getting ready, getting things straight, getting uh, things ironed, which Karen's great. She had that done last night, but, but we're on the move. And Karen shared a testimony of a lady that has sort of a very grave, grave diagnosis with cancer. And she was with a group of friends. I guess it was maybe online, conference call, I don't know. But she began to say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Give thanks in everything. Give thanks in everything. If we're gonna, if we're gonna pay attention to how we live, we're gonna look around for the thankful things that God has given to us. 
making the most of every opportunity? Are you taking the opportunity to give thanks to God? If someone stricken with cancer can find a reason to give thanks and you're walking healthily, who are you, who are you to not possess a grateful heart? Things for you might be tough now, but I guarantee you, you can look around and find something, some area where God has blessed you, possessing a right attitude toward God. And then, secondly, possessing a right attitude toward our fellow man. Look at verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of of Christ. In other words, he says in verse 15, pay careful attention to how you live. And it means, in part, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Guess what? Submission is not a four-letter word the last time I saw it. In a darkened world that is saying, get what you can, can it, walk over top of people, do what, it, 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 possessing a servant's heart will just make you a doormat. The light of God's word says, submit graciously to one another. This doesn't mean that you're weak. It means that you're strong. We're going to look at this word more next week in the context of marriage. But the first thing we need to get out of our head is that submission is a negative thing. In God's word, it's a very positive thing. Jesus willingly submitted himself to the will of the Father. Simply put today, we are light. We are light. And we're to make the most of every opportunity. We're, we're to live attentively. Sometimes I travel the area, and I'm sure if we had a sign, I probably would have been one of the first ones to put. And it, and it says this, all are welcome. At first I think, great, all are welcome. And the second thing, I think it suggests something else. We're here. You can come to us. That's not what I see in our text today. We're not to say we're here, our doors are open, you come to us. We're to go. We're to be light in our world. Thomas Aquinas, the great Italian theologian, philosopher of the 13th century, once said of the Christian's obligation... He says, if you want to convert a person to your view, go where he is. The light. Take him by the hand and guide him. He added, you don't stand across the room and shout at him. You don't order him to come over to you. You start where he is and work from that position. To me, that's living wisely. That's paying attention. That's being a present light. A darkened world. Let's pray. Father, we see Paul's primary commands today, Lord, to be light and to pay attention to how we live. Lord, we confess to you all too often we put that light under a bushel. And all too often, Lord, we allow days to pass without thinking about the things that spiritually matter. Lord, help us to live wisely, to make the most of the time, to be engaged in your words so that we know the will of God, to be controlled by your spirit, not by other things and substances. And Lord, to live our lives with a constant awareness of your goodness to us and your command, we serve one another. Lord, as we go forth through this study and as we come in the weeks ahead, may it be that we would take the challenge here to be your light. Not a light at a distance, but an ever-present light to a dark world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.